Greetings and thanks for joining us again for uh, uh, another episode of the Many Hats of Coco. I'm the host, Theo Shuk, and we're coming to you from the Tronson Art Gallery in Springfield, Oregon. Uh, thanks, Jim, for having us. Uh, today, we're joined by author Kathleen Criminosi. Criminosi? Cremonesi. Cremonesi. Uh, who is a National Gold Award winner uh, in the Ippy Awards, and, and we'll certainly get into that, and, and for memoir and family history for her book. And I'm just, uh, I got to read her book this past week, and I'm just delighted to have you. Can't, Kathleen, care to join me? Hi, Thea. Thank you. Well, let me grab my little book here because, uh, um, you know, I, I must say right off the top that I don't read romance, and we would, we would call this romance memoir. Would that be uh, fair? Maybe relationship memoir, but sure. It is a love story. There's romance. There's I, Italy. How can you I get away from that? I told you she'd be correcting my <laughs> words as we go on here. And I'm not, uh, I don't tend to read romance. I probably read, uh, you know, a handful in my life, and that's just not the way I go. But I got to tell you, the writing this, in this was just so much fun. It was just spectacular. Uh, I just really enjoyed uh, how you worked the language. And Thank you. on that note, we have Thank some you. questions for you. <laughs> uh, you know, first and foremost, I want to find out how a kid from a, a, a population of 500 in Elmira, or Oregon, uh, became, becomes a sideshow in an Italian circus. Not many people set out planning to be a sideshow in any circus, much less an Italian circus, but I had been traveling the United States around uh, for about a year and a half, following the Grateful Dead and loving it. But then I got tired of that. I wanted something new and different, and that happens a lot with me. So I went off looking for a new adventure and started hitchhiking around Europe. Uh, I, was ended, I ended up on a bus with some English gypsy travelers who were picking oranges in Spain to make ends meet. And picking oranges is not a lot of fun. It, you don't really earn any money. So one of them was a juggler, and he decided to uh, get a job in a circus. We saw the posters for the circus, and he wanted to get a job, but he didn't speak Spanish, and I spoke a little bit of Spanish. So I went with him to help him get a job in a circus, and the next thing you knew, I had a job in the circus. Oh. So. Very nice. Uh, so uh, what's it like to work in a circus? What did you do? And, and, uh... Uh, well, like with many things, it's all fascinating and beautiful and glittery and sparkly and sequins. Well, and let fun. me cut to the chase here. Working with elephants in, in, in general and uh, uh, almost, almost riding a giraffe, these are, these are pretty spectacular things that most people don't get the opportunity to do. You wrote elephants, you wrote ostrich. You wrote, I did read your book. Yes, so uh, I'm in the Shark Tank. Yeah. Um, so, like with anything, the fascin fascination wears off pretty quickly, especially when you see the grittier side of the circus, which it is pretty gritty. And I was enamored with those animals. The giraffe is just one of the most beautiful animals in the world for me. And to be able to be up close and pet it and caress it and rub it between its little ossicones and its ears and have it trust you. The only person it trusts in the entire circus was an amazing, humbling experience. But at the same time, you have to take into consideration why, you're why you are able to do that and why those animals are there and how they're being kept there. So as beautiful mm. as it is and as mm. cool as it was to mm. ride an elephant, it's actually not so cool, mm. you know? And, and like I said, it's all happy and, oh, look at these animals and this and this and that. And then the reality sets in and it's mm. not so pretty. And my husband, my then boyfriend, now husband, um, his original idea with joining the circus was, I'm gonna stay and help these animals. Mm -hmm. And that's a great thing to want to do but I asked myself now if I was helping them by being there and becoming their friends mm -hmm. or if I was facilitating mm -hmm. them being in captivity by feeding them 
and being a part of the circus. Yeah. So I was too young to ask myself those questions at the time. But the book's a lot bigger than that. In that, you, met, you just touched on your husband, and I want to mention the name of the book again, Love and the Elephant, How Running Away with the Circus Brought Me Home. And it's, it's really a beautiful love story, too, with how you met your husband, who was an Italian. Uh, he, he did the elephants in the first uh, circus that you that you worked with and how you met him. And so the story is much about that. And so it wasn't just about uh, the animals. It was about two particular animals, actually. <laughs> so so it was a wonderful story woven with, uh, with circus life. And how long uh, were you there? I know you didn't travel to Japan. You didn't get to, to do that. Uh, although you teased us in the book that that might be coming on. But that didn't unfortunately, uh, did fall into the cards. But uh, how long exactly were you with the, the circus? I joined the circus in December of 1988, and we were with the first circus a month, went to Italy and joined the second circus, and I was there for about two years. Mm -hmm. And part of that time was spent in Yugoslavia. Stefano and I left the circus in 1990. Mm -hmm. And... Um, moved to the United States. Mm -hmm. And so we we were married soon after, excuse me, 1991. We left the circus in 1991 and moved here and were married that sp early summer. Mm. And uh, it's been almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. And you have a little farm or a little? Five acres. Five acres. Too small for an mm -hmm. elephant mm -hmm. and a giraffe. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But we mm -hmm. have animals, three from the local shelter and a couple of cats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, the importance, so you did this at a young age. Uh, you know, we might say as an aside that when you were following the, uh, uh, the Grateful Dead, you did it in a classic manner in a, in a Volkswagen van. Absolutely. Let's, let's put that in there. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, exploring the world at a young age, uh, and especially as a young adult, and then ending up in the circus, care to, care to share any insights with us on that? I think it's incredibly important for people to get out of their comfort zone. And for some people, that may mean moving across town. For me, it meant going across the world. Um, when you challenge yourself, you give yourself the space and the need to grow. And I think that that's very important. I think it increases your view of the world and also helps you learn who you are. One thing about traveling that I found is when I started out, I was just so secure in who I was and what I wanted and where I was going and what I might do. And then the ground would shift under my feet and I had to reassess who am I, where am I going, what do I want, what do I need, you know, and what's the next step? How do I make that happen? And so I would set off again, secure in this new path and the ground would shift under my feet again and every time that happens it makes you stronger and helps you hone your idea of who you are and where you are in the world and how you are how you are in relation to the world because that changes you you can be one person the world is this way but when you put them together in certain ways it makes people change and see everything more fully um, I laugh because people say all the time that uh, like the internet brings us closer together, that you can just reach out and touch someone. And that's true from a very long ways away. But if you were to go to that place and meet that person, you might reach out and hug that person, which is a completely different thing and gives you a completely different understanding of who they are and what they might need out of life and out of this world and how it affects you. Mm -hmm. So you didn't go the traditional education route? No, I tried, but it, college just wasn't for me. I needed mm -hmm. more, different, mm -hmm. less structure. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. Grateful Dead, hitchhiking on a backpack and mm -hmm. setting mm -hmm. out to see the mm -hmm. world. I actually share some of the hitchhiking with a backpack thing. Um, and, and you're right. Everything you said is absolutely right. The more you get out of your comfort zone, the greater the opportunity to, to learn. When you're in your comfort zone, it's a... It's well, easy. It's, it's a comfort comfortable. Zone. <laughs> uh, how's, uh, on the writing process itself, since you didn't have a formal education, what, what kind of struggles did you go through with that? Everyone under the sun. Um, it was difficult for me. Not going to college 
no formal education. Um, the best thing I ever did was join a writing critique group. Mm -hmm. And it was a great group with very knowledgeable, patient, and encouraging people. Uh, we had between five, three to five people at various times. And this group used to laugh at me because I would say, I don't know, they would say, great use of an adverb there or something like that. And I was like, so what's an adverb again? I mean, I knew the difference between mm -hmm. a noun and a proper noun or whatever, person, place, or thing. I know that from elementary school, but I didn't know how to take experiences and put them on the page and form paragraphs. One time I asked them, and they still tease me about this, so what exactly is a paragraph? I mean, I knew it has a beginning mm -hmm. and end, and it's this long in a book or this long in a book, but how do you form, how do you take these words and know where they start and where it ends? And so through that process of writing and rewriting and rewriting, mm -hmm. I learned. Yeah. It took a long time. It took me about seven years, excuse me, five years to get a rough first draft. That's mm -hmm. a long time, and we mm -hmm. met almost weekly, so mm -hmm. there were a lot of meetings there. Um, one of my critique group partners owns a winery outside of town, and it's great wine, and I'll tell you, it sure helped bring me back there every week to pound out more story <laughs> and pound out more story. So, well, as long as you have an inspiration. <laughs> there we go, yeah. <laughs> and um, I just kept working at it. You know, I learned more, understood more, took a few classes here and there, and few more years to write a second draft, few more years to write another draft. And by that time, I actually had something that was uh, cohesive and understandable and appealing. The publisher who ended up purchasing it said one of the reasons why they bought it is because it was in near perfect state and well, they had well. almost no changes to make to it. Mm. Um, they, in fact, instead of asking me to cut things out, which is a common thing that a publisher does, they asked me to add some in in places where they felt that it needed to be fleshed out a little more. Mm. So mm -hmm. that was a mm. huge compliment it, after putting so much work in it to yeah. have anybody, you know, yeah. somebody actually. Like I said, I'm very impressed with the writing. It was, uh, you know, it was a delight. I mean, you, know, you, have, you have a good grasp of the language, whether it's natural or whether it was those five to seven years of <laughs> pounding out the wine, <laughs> drinking wine, whatever it the was. Wine goes in, the whatever it was, out. it served you well. <laughs> um, the American Library Association is one of the top ten sports and recreation books of 2015. Yes. So this book was a top sports and recreation. I. Thinking that um, it falls under recreation, but my common answer to that is, isn't love a sport? <laughs> okay. okay. It's, hard, it's hard to argue with that. You get knocked down, you get back up, you do some running, you slow down, you get a touchdown here and there. So when you were young, did you think you'd be a writer? Was that one of the, the things on the horizon? or? The only writing I ever imagined was like for National Geographic, which is even more of a pipe dream than writing a book and seeing mm -hmm. it through to publication. Um, that never happened. I would have loved it, but mm -hmm. I never pursued that. Do you have another book on the horizon? I do. That mm -hmm. horizon is a little far off there. I mm -hmm. started another book, mm -hmm. and I've got it laid out. It is fiction, and it has to do with animals, and I'm sure there will be a love mm -hmm. story in there as well. Uh, specifically with elephants. Um, and I started writing it because I had younger relatives mm -hmm. that wanted to read the book mm -hmm. and wanted to know a little bit more about animals and how they're kept in captivity and what that means. And I couldn't have, it's not a book for a seven-year-old or even an 11-year-old. Mm -hmm. It has a little more mm -hmm. adult themes there. So I wanted to write a book where they, that they could also read. Oh, so, nice. and that would go back, this was, as you said before, more focused on the love story aspect mm -hmm. and had some parts about animals and how they're kept. And I wanted to go there a little bit more because it's mm -hmm. something that's very important to me. Mm -hmm. And so I started that book and I've got the main chapters, you know, the beginning, the, the um, first point where something changes and the next point and how it wraps up. I have those written and I realized that I was, as with this book, shutting myself away in my office for hours at a time writing. Mm -hmm. And as much as I wanted to do that and did follow through doing that for this book, that's a lot of time. And it's very lonely time where I have a family of Stefano mm -hmm. and cats and dogs that are just right over there. And I hate that thought of, I'm busy, I'm writing, you know? So I wasn't quite ready to take another 
many year plunge into a book right now. The idea is there. My skills hopefully will remain mm -hmm. and um, I may come back to it at some point, but I'm picking shorter mm -hmm. uh, projects right now, namely painting. So. Oh, nice. Very nice. Um, just a quick question on, on the writing. Have you picked out a, a writer's group to work with? And more importantly, have you settled on the winery that you'll be? <laughs> for the next book. <laughs> yes, for the next book. I would always go back to the same group. There, mm -hmm. I just can't imagine somebody, uh, or excuse me, a group of women that would be better to meet with, mm -hmm. as I said, for their encouragement and their understanding, their ideas, their ways to push me to get down to the, the deeper story and things. Yeah, mm, I can't mm, imagine mm. a better group of women, so I would, nope, or, or better, better wine. wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and uh, did Coco have some questions? Coco, I understand you have some questions for our guests today. Yeah, they are. I certainly do. Um, one of the questions is, what prompted you to write the book to begin with? When my husband, Stefano, then boyfriend, of course, first came back to the United States and we would meet people. So many people, he has a thick, thick Italian accent, still does, all these years later. And um, people would ask, where are you from, Italy? And how did you two meet? And then the circus would come out and they were like, a circus? That's crazy. It sounds like a book. You should write a book. It sounds like a movie, you know? And so I just got this idea in my head, I should write a book having no idea what was involved, how complicated it would be, how much time it would take. Um, but that's the way I go at most things in life, you know, whether it's going traveling. I don't really know where I'm going with it. I just, I go with the painting, with uh, so many things. Re renovating a house, which my husband and I did some years back. We had no idea. It's actually the, the wing of the old motel that I grew up in that's mentioned in the book that used to be in Eugene, and then it was hauled out west of town. Um, we had no idea what we were getting into. And that's good, because if we had any idea, we wouldn't have done it. But now we've got this gorgeous home, and we know every inch of it. We built it to suit our, our desires, our needs, what we love. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Um, the other question is, what type of classes did you take um, for help, and are they local? Uh, the very first class was through LCC. It was taught by Elizabeth Engstrom, and I will always honor that class because at the end of the class, Elizabeth Engstrom said, if you're serious about writing, you need to belong to a critique group. So at the end of this class, whoever is serious, please raise your hand and find other people who are interested in forming a critique group with you. And that's what I did, and that's where my critique group was formed in 1998. So that, that class, yes. A few others through LCC, Oregon Writers Colony hosts classes. Uh, the Willamette Writers, they have uh, monthly meetings, and they have little uh, classes with that. And then, of course, the Willamette Writers Conference is immeasurable in how valuable it is and the caliber of the teachers and the classes that they have there. And it's held up in Portland once a year in August, and I went probably three or four times up there. Oh, great. Stacks of notes coming back, inspiration and drive to get through the, the job. Great. Another question we have is, um, what was your favorite dead show while you were traveling in Europe? Oh. We or Coco, is that from you in particular? <laughs> <laughs> um, so my favorite dead show while traveling in Europe? I didn't get to see the dead in Europe. Oh, well, that's too bad. It was really well, bad. I have a funny concert story from, from Europe, though. Um, when you're in a circus, you are as tied down and as captive as the animals that are there. It's, mm. it's weird to think about, but it's true. And um, sometimes I think that might have been a good thing, because if it were easier to get out of the circus, I might have run off from the relationship that I was forming with my husband when it got difficult, but sometimes I felt just as chained down as those animals were. Um, one time we were performing on the Adriatic coast, the east coast of Italy, just a little bit south of Venice, and I happened to catch a newspaper that said something about Pink Floyd coming to Venice. and. I brought it to my husband. I was like, I didn't read Italian then. I didn't speak Italian very well. And I was like, 
are the Pink Floyd going to be in Venice? Are we, can we go? Can we go? And he was like, no, no, absolutely not. The tickets will be too expensive. I was like, come on, Stefano, it would be so It's Pink Floyd. And he loved Pink Floyd too. I had seen a concert at the Oakland Coliseum soon before going to Europe. And he's like, listen to me, Kathleen. It's too expensive. There will be scalpers. The tickets will be astronomical. No, we cannot go. And I took his word for it. And then I saw another new newspaper article that explained that the concert, the concert was free. And they were playing on a floating stage just off of St. Mark's Place. Wow. It would have been the Pink Floyd concerts of all Pink Floyd concerts. And I missed it. And you missed oh. it. And I missed it because I listened to him. It was the last time I listened to him about a concert. <laughs> <laughs> Is that I, it, Coco? I think that's all the questions well, we have right now. Well, I have now. one more. Do you have anything coming up that we should be aware of? Any uh, shows or uh, visits or? No shows coming up in the near future. Okay. Um, we the book is in progress of being uh, made into an audiobook, oh, which is sweet. very exciting. Um, I have sent a submission <clears throat> in to hopefully narrate it myself, but the company that's purchasing the rights gets to decide that. So I don't know if I will or not, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. that's kind of exciting. To, it'll be able to reach a whole new group of readers, listeners. Mm -hmm. Well, listen, it's been an absolute delight. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome, Theo. Um, Thank you and, for having uh, me. We can and, give her uh, a little of this, can't we? Thank you for coming. Thank you. It was really good.